afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Frank Holder. I'm the chairman of EFA Plus, and I'm joined um, in person by Brian uh, Gallant, who's the CEO of Space Canada, a total overachiever. We'll hear about that later. And I think I'm being joined by Janet Cavandi uh, from Outer Space. Um, she's the president of Sierra Space, and by Mike Greenley, who is the CEO of MDA. Yes. So, hey, everyone. Hi. So. So I'll give you a little background. I'm gonna start with um, Brian because he's physically present here. Um, he's the CEO of Space Canada. Um, he was the 33rd premier of New Brunswick. I asked him if he was 14, but apparently he was 30 uh, when he had that job, or 32? 32. 32. Yeah. 32. Um, he was also uh, a member of the Can Canadian Center for the Purpose of the Corporation. I love the name of that. It's just very, it's like a tongue twister, but it's, it's sort of about ESG. Uh, he also was involved with the Roger Cybersecurity Catalyst and is now obviously uh, part of uh, the uh, Space Canada. So basically he's a poster child for the new Canada. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Um, then uh, we also have Janet, who is my new favorite person that I've only met virtually uh, because she's been in space and apparently orbited quite a few times. Uh, I want to ask you a question later about space trash, Janet, but for now, um, okay. she's the president of Sierra Space Corporation. Uh, they're the ones building the Dream Chaser space plane. Um, I've, I'm trying to get a ticket, uh, don't have one yet. Um, Sierra Space has also partnered with Blue Origin uh, to place a commercial space station in orbit. It's called Orbital Reef uh, by 2027, which is a hugely ambitious uh, project and, and, and pretty amazing. Uh, she leads the uh, Sierra Space Human Sp Space Flight Center and Astronaut Training Academy. Um, and she's responsible for the selection, training, and human health uh, for all categories of space travelers, professionals, industry, and experiential customers. So that should cover just about everybody. Um, she served 25 years at NASA prior to coming to CR Space, uh, director of the Glenn Research Center, and prior to that, uh, director of flight cooperation. So uh, she flew three uh, space shuttle missions, logged 33 days in space, and traveled 13.1 million miles in 535 Earth orbits. Um, last but certainly not least uh, is Mike Greenley, who's the CEO of MDA. Um, founded in 1969, MDA is an international space mission partner and a robotic satellite system and geo-intelligence pioneer. Uh, I, I would think in 69, if you were doing robotics, you're definitely a pioneer uh, back in those days. It's a publicly traded company on the Toronto Stock Exchange, headquartered in Canada. Mr. Greenlee oversees more than 2,400 employees across the country, um, as well as operations in, in the small neighbor to the south, um, the United States and the UK. Uh, before joining MDA, he was uh, president of L3 Westcam. Uh, that's a Homeland Security Law Enforcement and Defense Systems company. He was also a VP and GM of CAE Canada, and as well uh, a part of General Dynamics. He is the Vice Chair of Space Canada as well, so he works with my colleague here, and is the Vice Chair of the Government of Canada's Economic Strategy Table for Advanced Manufacturing. Um, I, I'd have to point out there's a lot of background in engineering that I see here in R&D, so that's great for some of the questions that I have. Uh, and he's recognized for his business and community leadership as an Ottawa Top 40 Under 40 Business Leader. Um, a, a Profit 100 CEO for leading one of Canada's fastest growing companies for three years running and a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal for Service to peers and country in the defense sector. So welcome, distinguished panelists. My first question is going to be a softball. Um, just catch us up to speed on what's going on in Sierra Space uh, with Space Canada and with MDA. So ladies first. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us today. We really appreciate being here. Um, with respect to Sierra Space, you did mention that we are flying the Dream Chaser space plane. So I did bring this, uh, this prop here so yes. that you can see what the Dream Chaser looks like. It is um, similar in size, and sh well, not in size, but in shape to the space shuttle. It looks a lot like what the space shuttle, shuttle used to look like. It does have an additional 
uh, cargo module on the aft end, uh, if you can see that there, that can ad carry additional cargo. We are currently under contract with NASA to fly seven cargo resupply missions to the International Space Station, uh, and we are due uh, for our first launch in about a year from now. Uh, we are getting very close to completing our production of this um, vehicle, and from this point, it will travel to the NASA Glenn Research Center, where it will undergo its environmental testing, and then on to Florida, where we will prep it for launch. Um, in addition, you mentioned our partnership with Blue Origin, and we are partnering on a commercial space station and where we are equal partners at, at the time, at the current time. Uh, we are planning to build an inflatable module um, that can be used for habitation and or laboratory space. Um, the great advantage of inflatable is that you get much more volume per launch. Uh, so you can gain uh, three to four times as much volume in, in, one, in one launch uh, from that. So you do save on the launch cost, which helps uh, affordability and the uh, you know pollutants that are given off during the launch process. So uh, trying to be as wise there as we can possibly be. Blue Origin is providing a central core module, uh, and they will also be providing the power, uh, the power step back. And then we will also have other partners uh, who will join us on Orbital Reef and the transportation will be largely provided by Dream Chaser for both cargo and crew. So we're also developing our crew version and it should be ready to fly uh, by 2026. And that's why we have the Human Space Flight Program and work down in Florida. Awesome. Mike? Um, Thanks. Um, MDA is a busy these days, um, being a pure play space company headquartered here in Canada, but uh, delivering globally. Uh, three primary sets of activities going on at the moment. Uh, one is in geo-intelligence. Uh, we own and operate a radar base, the Earth Observation Satellite Radar Sat. Uh, two, um, and we're busy developing our next generation of Earth Observation uh, Radar Satellites in Cora. So delivering um, Earth Observation data and imagery uh, to government and commercial customers around the world. Uh, a second area would be satellite systems, where we deliver uh, satellite subsystems to satellite manufacturers for geosynchronous orbit. And we de deliver uh, full satellites for low Earth orbit or LEO constellations um, to uh, cu customers around the world. A strong growing part of the business today. Uh, that business also works on other types of communication systems and subsystems, in, uh, including supporting Dream Chaser. CR Space is a very important customer of ours. Um, and lastly, in robotics and space operations, uh, where we have the history of uh, delivering uh, Canada Arm for shuttle, uh, flying the 100 missions there with Canada Arm and Canada Arm 2 currently on the International Space Station. Uh, we're busy working on Canada Arm 3, uh, which will be the robotic system for Gateway, the new space station that will uh, orbit the moon, in addition to a, uh, a suite of uh, commercial robotic systems uh, that will be derivatives of Canada Arm 3 uh, to be able to deliver to uh, spacecraft and space station and on-orbit uh, customers uh, moving forward commercially in the future. Awesome. Brian, what's going on at uh, Space Canada? Uh, but bonjour tout le monde. Je suis ravi d'être ici avec vous tous et toutes. So Space Canada is an organization that represents Canada's space sector and ecosystem domestically and abroad. We're looking to um, shape the conversation around space, uh, promote the Canadian space sector internationally and here in Canada, uh, advocate for the Canadian space sector as well, uh, enhance collaboration within the industry, enhance collaboration with key stakeholders, and educate and raise awareness with uh, the Canadian public, with uh, people like all of you in this room, uh, to the importance of space and what it can do for our everyday lives, what it can do to help us tackle societal and planetary challenges, and, and what it can do for our economy, what it can do for people's careers. So uh, very happy to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about that with all of you today. Great, um, thank you for that. So I'm gonna start with a little bit more challenging questions. Um, Janet, in your view, what are the most important challenges facing the global space sector today? Um, I think uh, that we're in the midst of the transition away from completely government-sponsored space transportation. As we all know, you know, uh, we have traditionally worked with partners uh, internationally, um, 
Canada has been a major player, Japan, the European uh, Space Agency, the United States and Russia have been the key players. We are now um, transitioning from a government sponsored space, all these space programs to private industries. And the, some of the biggest challenges is, you know, whereas the government could uh, sometimes afford to, to spend many billions of dollars on, on spacecraft, um, private sector doesn't generally have that unless you have a sponsor who happens to have uh, several billions of dollars. So be, trying to become as efficient as we can when we launch vehicles, when we fly vehicles, when we design them using modern um, techniques for manufacture, manufacturing is very critical and that we adapt all of these known um, advantages that we can gather from other partners in aerospace and, and avionics and, and aeronautics uh, and try to make these um, new components more affordable when we put them in spacecraft. Um, and then the launch costs are also um, pretty prohibitive at times. So uh, the reusable rockets that have been developed and demonstrated many times now really help bring down the costs of launch providing. Uh, providing the, the services of launching spacecraft. So the more that we work on these things and we're able to bring the costs down, we will make this a much more affordable um, endeavor for businesses to be able to access space and manufacture um, products in microgravity that they cannot manufacture here on the ground. So you don't think this is a club for the hyper-rich uh, uh, that uh, long-term, this is a transition period where we're going from government and uh, and and multi hundred billionaires into a more uh, f a broader and larger uh, private sector government uh, joint initiative. I I do believe that um, if if it were the alternate, um, this would not last very long. And I think it's important that we learn to utilize this new frontier you know we talk about well it's not really new anymore but the next frontier we've always talked about the next frontier we've pretty much uh, been able to uh, investigate populate most of the surface and under the sur surface of the united states and, and all the countries in the world all the all the uh, different uh, areas where we can possibly use um, and, and manufacture our products the next logical location is to take it off the surface of the planet and put it in lower orbit. We'd be able to manufacture things that you cannot manufacture on the ground due to the microgravity uh, advantages that you have from manufacturing there. But if we leave it only to tourism, uh, for those that cannot afford rides, that will burn out pretty quickly. And we will miss out on a great opportunity to actually use microgravity's benefits in making products that make life here on Earth better. So the intent of, of Sierra Space is to make that happen. We do not have multi-billion dollar um, owners who can spend their life's wealth on that. We are owned uh, in part by Aaron and Fadi Osman who helped found this company, but uh, it's not the same category uh, as, as some of the other players in the field. So we really need to make it work uh, as a business uh, to enable future commercial, uh, commercialization of lower Thorpe. And Mike, uh, a, a tough challenge, I think, is workforce. Um, it's a tough challenge for all businesses right now in the world, but I would assume you need a fairly highly specialized workforce in order to address this growing uh, space industry. And I know you have several thousand employees across Canada. How do you see that evolving? Um, it's definitely a, a key element of the growth of the space sector in terms of us being able to bring in uh, talent into all of our corporations around the world, um, engage them in the space sector, transfer knowledge and technology from those that might have been around for the last uh, 25 and 50 years and participate in the sector and bringing up that next generation of expanded workforce. Um, for us, we're being pretty successful at that in Canada. Um, I think we've hired over 1,200 people since March 2020 when COVID started um, into our corporation. Um, and uh, about 670 last year and over 200 so far this year um, in that pace. So the, uh, it's an attractive sector for people. Um, everybody in the economy uh, needs to hire systems engineers, software engineers, artificial intelligence engineers uh, to be able to work on their systems. So now more than ever, the, 
financial companies, insurance companies, um, while the same types of people. Um, I think one of the advantages that we have in the space sector is the material that we get to work on, the content that we have, and that you get to work on space and space challenges. So when you interview people, there's folks that are you know, very talented, strong engineers that are legitimately interested in the space, space sector, but then there's this whole other population that their eyes light up and shine and say, I've been dreaming about space since I was four years old and, and I would just love to be able to apply my talents to space. And that comes in engineers, but also in finance and marketing and everything else. So when you see those folks in the interview, there's a, a special passion that you probably don't get when someone says, I, I want to come work for your company and build an artificially intelligent form to be able to fill out for my insurance claim. It's it's a bit different than when you get to go and work on space and you've been dreaming about it your whole life. So um, we get to leverage the content of the work that we do and the fact that people are going to work on things uh, that are really going to go into work, right? They're really going to go into space and that they're going to be uh, successful um, based on the, the challenges that they get to work on. So we have to have attractive places to work. Uh, we have to compensate people fairly, obviously. Um, all the same thing that any other employer does. And then we have to uh, uh, leverage leverage our content and the things people get, get to work on to make sure that we have a diverse and inclusive workforces. People get to like uh, play on the field. They get to work with people more experienced them and uh, have knowledge transferred to them and grow quickly in their careers. So, so far we're being successful in that, but it will remain a challenge as we move forward. Well, I'm excited about it after that commentary. Um, so Brian, a, a different kind of question, but in an environment where we're trying to reduce greenhouse gases and where we're trying to go to carbon neutrality and where at least for now the space sector still employs probably in some ways 1950s and 60s technology in terms of rockets to launch i know a lot of other stuff's going on we can talk about that later but there's still a fair you know it's a fairly you know pollutive type uh you know technology a, how do we diversify away from that and continue to innovate in space? And B, how do you keep space as a priority when so many other projects are clamoring for this? So you have a background in cyber and ESG and in, in, in space. How, uh, you know, how, how do you do that here in Canada and, and just in general? Well, Frank, since I'm on stage, I'm going to take the opportunity to actually comment on Janet and Mike's comments, if that's all right. Uh, yeah. They can't really stop me with Zoom. I mean, they can't mute me or anything. I could so physically, yeah, you but could, yeah. it would be quite a show. So, so, oh, so I, I just want to add, I think their, their, their responses were great, and I just want to sort of emphasize. I, I think uh, to, to Janet's point in terms of the challenge, I'm super worried about the idea that with an emerging industry like the space sector and with the, the fact that we're transitioning, as Janet very well said, to government-led initiatives, to the private sector playing a very enhanced role, I worry about governments all over, so Canada included, that the governance models that were used before to be able to support the space sectors domestically and even internationally aren't going to work anymore. So I worry that in this transi transition it's going to be clunky. I worry that we're going to miss opportunities. I, I worry that uh, we're unfortunately maybe going to make some mistakes. So, so I really hope that governments, and I think they do, and it's I've been there, by the way, so I recognize it's hard to it's hard to keep up with these types of emerging and transitions. So I I, I get that, but at the same time, uh, just because it's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't be very focused on it. So I just wanna I just wanted to emphasize that, and I just want to add to what Mike said as well. He mentioned diversity. I think it's so important for an emerging sector like space, uh, with great economic opportunity, that we look to have uh, more women in STEM education. Uh, that we have also other types of diversity. Uh, represented here in Canada and internationally in the sector because it's going to be such an important sector economically so lots of lots of opportunity that we want to make sure everybody has a role to play but also it's going to be the sector is going to be tackling major challenges like climate change so I'll get into that in a sec so we, we do want perspectives from different uh, different backgrounds to be able to help us do that so for climate change uh, very interestingly the World uh, Meteorological Organization said uh, they report that over 50% uh, of the variables that we need to monitor to fight climate change and mitigate against climate change have to be monitored through space. So, so to me, that's like argument number one that we should be prioritizing the space sector. Uh, what's really fascinating is there's huge economic opportunity. A country like Canada that I know uh, over the next few months and, and years is going to be looking for opportunities to be able to grow their economy, create jobs that hopefully are uh, going to be contributing to fight 
uh, the, the societal and planetary challenges that we face, well, space can do that for sure. And in terms of the specifics of space, uh, there's great data that demonstrates that the work that we do, even if there are some emissions that come with launch, uh, are going to be worth it. Uh, one, one stat that I just gave you and many others that will demonstrate that, in fact, it's very economic for us to do that, to be able to properly fight climate change. But we have to keep innovating and we have to find ways to be able to relaunch uh, some of our vehicles, which, which a lot of work is being done. And to tie it all together, a lot of that work is being done by the private sector. Uh, so it's a huge element that we need to figure out in the space sector and that's going to be the private sector that's focused on it. So it goes back to the first point that Janet made. Uh, we need to make sure that governments are, are doing what they can to support this transition to a di much more collaborative approach to this sector. Thank you. I see why people elected you premier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, one of the questions I had is around innovation, and this is for everyone. Um, it seems to me that there are some very clear examples of space initiatives giving us innovative products that work in other mm. industries and in other ways to enhance quality of life of mankind as a whole uh, in some cases may actually make us more efficient or less polluting or you know uh, in in some ways change the economy so uh, for any of you how do you view innovation in terms of being a key factor in the argument for heavy investment in uh, the space industry you're too polite so i'll just janet <laughs> Um, well, thank you. I, I have really um, grown interested in the capabilities of microgravity in the biopharma area. Uh, we're making great inroads into research with stem cells, uh, how we can potentially print uh, organs in space and or grow organs from stem cells in space. The microgravity allows the organ to grow without the pressure of gravity on it and form in its, in its full shape like it should. And that is very intriguing to me. If we can uh, make that a viable manufacturing, if we can actually grow organs in space and use those, you can actually send your own stem cell and have you know spare parts, if you will. Um, and that way we can progress from having to unfortunately wait for people to pass away so that we can harvest those organs for people in need. And I think if we could just, you know, just, just one example of something that I think space flight would make possible, um, not just space flight, but actual manufacturing and microgravity would make possible. Uh, we also found that we've been able to develop um, cures for different cancers from research done in space. So there's a lot of bio, um, biopharma and bioengineering that I think uh, is very feasible. We also know we can grow crystals uh, more uniformly with less defects up yeah. there, uh, which can be used for um, purposes that are they need very, very high reliability uh, microchips and things like that. So uh, along those lines, I think if we're able to do that, we will have really contributed back to the benefit and made life better here for most people on the planet. Excellent. Mike? Um, for us, I'd like to speak to innovation in the areas we get involved in and then what kind of the benefits it brings to Earth. And um, as uh, Brian was saying, in uh, the whole Earth observation side, as we bring more and more innovation to Earth observation satellites, um, uh, we continue to push the boundaries of what we can do for monitoring climate change, uh, deforestation, immigration patterns, uh, the health of the oceans. Um, lately, we've been combating illegal fishing. Uh, so we're able to use the, the technological innovations there for great purposes on Earth. On the communication side, as we build lower orbit constellations for communications, I, I think that's really powerful to be able to bring um, high-speed networks and data communications all around the world, no matter where people live, so that you know anyone, no matter where they reside in the world, has equal access to it, an education or be able to start a business online or participate in the economy. Um, I think that's like a, a phenomenal impact of the, the innovation that will come from our, our space-based networks. In, in things like robotics, uh, in, in orbit, we've had a lot of experience with that where our, uh, our control systems for highly dexterous robotics so that we can have very fine but forceful grasp um, in orbit, uh, transferring, transferring that technology to uh, terrestrial or Earth-based applications. We've had a, a few solid examples of that, um, being able to uh, create robotic systems or license our technology for the creation of robotic systems to support brain, brain surgery. Uh, we're involved in another startup right now for multiple degree of freedom robotics. 
uh, to be able to do uh, diagnostic and next treatment of breast cancer um, using the same control systems that we use on Canada on the International Space Station. So we're always finding different application areas to be able to uh, transfer the hard problems we solve in space uh, to terrestrial problems on Earth. While we're doing that, the whole uh, notion of uh, Janet's past profession and what she's uh, supporting now with her commercial space stations and the like, there's there's a just a, a macro impact on innovation that occurs in terms of the the inspiration that comes from people, you know, going to space, exploring space, participating in space. Um, we've all seen the benefits of engaging youth and their uh, imaginations in what we do in space, which motivates them to study science, technology, engineering, and math and to be sort of boundaryless in the pursuit of their goals. So there's a there's a, a macro effect of our participation in the space sector as well than this from the specific uh, technological innovations themselves. And I would say like materials science as well. It's tremendous the amount of progress in materials just because of the stresses they have to uh, survive in order to, to function in space. Right? Two types of materials. One is yes, what you just said, and then what Janet was talking about in terms of the next generation of on-orbit manufacturing where a next generation of materials will be able to be created in space with um, all kinds of different material and biochemical reactions that can occur in the zero gravity environment that Janet was speaking to. And yeah, Frank, if I, if I could add, there's a great group out of Calgary, a little cluster that are looking into how we can better deliver healthcare in space. And they're very, very deliberate about thinking about how do we do this? And then how do we apply this here on earth? How do we apply this for rural and remote and Northern communities? So just to give you an example as to when you're pushing for innovation for something like, you know, reaching for the moon, um, you can literally uh, change things here on earth. So I, I think there's wonderful examples of that. And I just want to add to what Mike said on the macro. I mean, today, actually is the day if you would have uh, if you had the chance to, to look at your phones I'm sure you've been so enthralled with the uh, with the panels that you haven't but um, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope released uh, photos today and you know what what an innovation on the macro side what an innovation to know kind of you know more about our existence and how stars are being formed and all these just amazing things uh, that that 25 years ago we probably didn't even think was possible so uh, it, it's also on the macro bringing I like to think the world together a bit to collaborate collaborate on things uh, that are of great import. So uh, hopefully that's going to inspire the next generation to, to get involved. I think you accidentally teed up my next question, but it's kind of in the, in the category of who owns space, right? So one of the issues that we have is, uh, I read about these nightmare scenarios with all this trash spinning around uh, the earth and getting in the way of some of the innovation we want to do in terms of communications or or, or uh, satellite technology and you know in the end there's a regulatory responsibility here and there's some sort of a, a responsibility we all have uh, as, as humanity to responsibly utilize this new frontier and there's been historically a bit of a frontier mentality when it comes to who has what and who owns what and who went where so wh what, are, what are the what is the thinking today in how to regulate or or utilize this the, this resource in a way that's fair to humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take that easy question? It's a real softball. Come on, guys. I think that in general, people recognize that need. I think if we go back to the 1400s and people started using the oceans to start bopping around between continents, there was there was no rules. Um, and, and gradually, uh, in our oceans and in our airways, we've uh, you know over time increasingly collaborated amongst uh, all countries, uh, those that get along every day and some of the ones that don't um, um, have absolutely come to a place where we do have, you know, the laws of the ocean, the laws of the sea, the laws of our airspaces and the like. Um, so I think there's just general recognition that um, that, that has to emerge um, over time. Right now we have, uh, you know, certain levels of, of, of regulation that you know, causes us to, you know, get permission to launch things and conditions of which we can launch things um, and put them into orbit. Um, but there's a, a lot more to come in terms of creating the norms of operating in space uh, as it becomes, uh, as we become more congested and as they become more competitive um, moving forward into the future. So um, uh, people recognize that. Uh, I know myself, I've participated in a number of distant discussions and forums uh, towards uh, trying to like start to talk about defining the norms of space and uh, the you know what where the different governments and industrial organizations can work together to contribute towards that. So that's just it's an it's a natural thing that will emerge. Um, 
and uh, uh, we will all participate in that moving forward. Yeah, I, I agree and I would um, say that if we don't control that, then it will be actually too dangerous to put humans up there. We are already maneuvering the International Space Station multiple times a week to avoid debris that's in space. Uh, um, most of it is unintentional debris or debris that was uh, has been up for maybe decades in some cases, but mostly it's uh, come up in the last few years. Uh, I think the ability to remove anything that you put up in orbit is should be essential. If you're going to send it up, you need to be able to safely bring it back down in a controlled way. Um, uh, but I do think um, Mike is right. If we don't have some sort of an international agreement, and I think UNUSA is, is helping to work on that, uh, it could be a free for all, and that just will not be safe for anyone. Uh, any collision up there, intentional or not, creates so much debris that then is not predicted, and it's very difficult to predict and very difficult difficult to maneuver around, uh, and that really deters people from wanting to. to to go up there just because of that risk, not just to the people, but to their hardware. Um, so we really do have to come together internationally to make sure that that, that is controlled. If I can add, I, I take the plug to, to sort of talk about why the space sector should absolutely be a priority. I'm, I'm very uh, happy and pleased that we're, we're discussing at this forum. Uh, the World Economic Forum came up with its uh, 2022 risks earlier this year and uh, paraphrasing them, but essentially uh, there was climate change. So we talked about the role that space can play for us to tackle and mitigate climate change. Uh, there was also the uh, economic and uh, income disparities where they had three or four categories, digital divide being one of them. Space is going to be a very crucial and pivotal uh, uh, piece of the, of the solution to help uh, bridge that divide. Then you had cybersecurity threats under geopolitical tensions. Again, space plays a big role. And then for the first time ever, you literally had space written out in one of the top risks, which was traffic. So space traffic uh, rounded up the, the number five of the top five list of uh, the World Economic Forum risks. So um, when I saw that, I had uh, just I had just sort of started uh, with Space Canada, and I and I was relieved because I, I felt you know what I really am I think helping a sector that can play an immense role in in tackling and combating and fighting things that I worry about and I think Canadians worry about as well. So hopefully you're all going to leave today saying, wow, we got to do more in space. We got to figure this stuff out. We got to be playing more of an active role here in Canada, and and uh, and I think we have lots to offer the international community as they look to do more as well. So along those same lines, um, investing in, in, in any initiative in space is quite expensive. The capital uh, is a lot and the technical barriers are quite high. So the barriers to entry are uh, maybe insurmountable for some. How, how do we create uh, something that is more equitable and fair and allows more people to participate in something that is normally more of an oligopoly than uh, than a, a, a global phenomenon. Yeah, I, I can start off. So I think the first thing I would mention when, when I uh, have been over the last few months meeting the ecosystem in Canada, I can tell you there are just some brilliant people uh, with startups and uh, all ready to scale up. There's people that are looking into very fascinating initiatives that would help the space sector. So, so I would say that, that uh, I think your question is a very good one, but I just don't want us to think that the idea of space is only launched. There's a bunch of other people that are playing a role in, in helping the ecosystem. So that would be one thing, specifically to, to sort of the upfront cost. I think government has a very significant role to play. Uh, and it goes back to what Janet mentioned, probably I think the most important point that, uh, that you've all heard so far is that there is this transition between the government-led initiatives in the space sector to, to the private sector playing uh, a pivotal role and even leading this, many of the initiatives. Uh, so with that transition, we, we also have to think how do we help the smaller players? How do we create uh, uh, the, the environment in which we can see these startups uh, get going, they can scale up, they can help maybe some of the larger players in our country and around the world be able to figure out some of these very difficult problems. And I think if we can do that uh, here in Canada, we'll reap many economic benefits and we'll also feel really good about doing some great things for humanity and the planet. Uh, and also I think we'll be able to be a leader internationally as well. So uh, I, I would, uh, that, that's what I would submit to you today on that. 
Any other comments to add? I mean, I think the one you make about ecosystem is really important. We've learned from Silicon Valley and other experiments that um, innovation and growth comes from a combination of the big guys. Uh, there's a whole food chain, right? And and uh, if you can create an ecosystem, you definitely create more opportunity for, for, for others. Uh, you know, I can just, oh, go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. Ladies first, okay. that's the rule. Uh, I was going to say, and, and the, thank you. <laughs> in the case of Sierra Space, um, we were carved out of the Sierra Nevada Corporation, and then we went out and, and performed a capital raise, and we were able to, to raise $1.42 billion, which was a, a record in, in this country, at least for, for that kind of investment. There's a lot of excitement from investors to be involved in space. Um, I think the expectations though have to be pretty clear that that it isn't a short-term mm -hmm. uh, payback for investors. This is you know space because of the because of the cost of uh, investing in these kinds of vehicles and and the and uh, the time that it takes. Um, the turnaround is is in more than just a couple of years. It's it maybe a decade in in some cases. So uh, that patience and um, and. Uh, willingness to wait for the payback over that period of time, I think it's necessary for investors to have the full um, awareness of what it takes to do this. Uh, and um, I think uh, Brian also said that continued support of our governments to give contracts, to give us places to go, to give us reasons to develop this technology and in ensure that there are missions that we can demonstrate these technologies with is critical. If we didn't have uh, missions to the ISS with Dream Tracer, we really probably would not be able to develop this vehicle. So uh, having those types of contracts uh, available to us to compete for and then using um, those to demonstrate the capabilities that we then uh, expand upon and, and make human space flight possible with the new space plane. So it is, um, a compounding effort, and uh, I think that all of these uh, areas working together, the government, private sector, investors, really are what's going to make this possible in the future. Mike? I think there's also like a, a little bit of a, um, a, a misperception there as well, depending on how people perceive the inaccessibility of space. Um, the, uh, you know, we've seen back to those investors that need to take a long-term view, they're increasing in numbers. So we're seeing uh, venture capital going into the space sector, you know, doubling in size every year for the past four or five years. Um, the, the number of space startups globally is in the, in the, in the hundreds, if not in the low thousands um, of the new space startups. Um, with the cost of launch, uh, decline. It hasn't declined all the way yet, but moving from you know eighteen thousand dollars a kilogram back in the space shuttle days to you know one and a half to three thousand dollars a kilogram now, um, with goals of you know future future launch platforms like Starship trying to get to one to two hundred dollars a kilogram. Um, you know there's going to be increasing opportunity for folks to access space, and so. Uh, people with a good idea for a, a, a sensor that can observe the Earth or a, uh, a new type of communication technology that they can get some venture capital for, they can now access space. Um, uh, granted, uh, at times we need those uh, anchor government customers to be able to enable it or government customer programs to be able to get people on their first mission, but the, the accessibility of space increases every year. So for an economy that you know, today is around 385 to 400 billion dollars a year that people forecast that will get up over a trillion dollars as we get into the, the late 2030s and into the 2040 time frame. Um, this, this is a significantly growing new economy that um, does have increasing accessibility. It, it's challenging, but it is still increasingly accessible for uh, folks to participate in in that ecosystem that Brian was talking about. So you stimulated Brian's thinking, so he has another comment. Yeah, one, one quick thing I would just add as well. Uh, another aspect that government could really help with is developing the framework for commercial launch uh, here in Canada. So, so we really don't have that at the moment, and I know the federal government's working on it. So uh, just to put on the radar that is, when it comes out that it is something that we certainly believe is needed. And, and obviously, if you want uh, any business, but uh, especially smaller businesses, to be able to think about if ever they're going to be able to launch, they need to know what the 
rules are. They need to know practically what they need to do. Some with maybe uh, deeper pockets will take the risk and right now and make some investments, but that's obviously not easy. So you, you want to know what the roadmap is. So getting that certainty from the federal government will be very helpful, and, and I know that they're working on it uh, as we speak. So just a few minutes left, and uh, you know, in, in closing, we, we've spoken a lot about innovation, about the economic impact and the growing new economy here, about how space can be important for the environment and how uh, it can spin off technologies that are helpful for all sorts of industries, including manufacturing. Um, the one thing we didn't touch on that uh, I want to close with, uh, ask each one of you is, we haven't really talked about exploration. So we're talking a lot about the immediate space around us space, but you know, um, to one of Janet's earlier comments, the final frontier, that Star Trek uh, introduction. What are your views on the importance of us continuing to invest in exploration? Janet? Well, yeah, I, um, having been at NASA for a quarter of a century, I, I really, of course, have to have believed in exploration. I think that the ability for humans to uh, go out and explore for the sake of exploring results in so many products that we never anticipate. Um, just like building the space station is going to result in so much science and research that we don't anticipate. The things, it's inevitable, right? The things we're looking for end up often not being the things that we find that are the most valuable. Uh, sometimes they're just a byproduct of what we're looking for. So being able to explore, to potentially mine uh, this planet, to potentially do manufacturing of hazardous materials in a location where we don't pollute the environment, um, where we can study our planet now, and uh, I think Mike mentioned the clear cutting, and uh, I have seen and my, with my own eyes the devastation of runoff that happens after we clear cut, um, especially along the Amazon, you just see all the you know surface soil that is lost forever into the ocean every day. And it's just um, very sad. And you, sometimes it takes seeing to believing. Um, we can't unfortunately take everyone to space to see that, but uh, there is a greater awareness the more we go up and the more we explore, the more we find new technologies and uh, resources uh, we can, smartly um, in an educational way we can we can put that to good use and help the planet here better than we could have if we had not explored thank you mike um like i can speak from our perspective as a, as a corporation involved in space exploration um, it's a uh, it's a it, to us it's a legitimate market it's a legitimate growth area for the future um the uh the the, the transition uh, to more uh, commercial um, the space stations and on orbit, the commercial on orbit uh, servicing, assembly, manufacturing environments and platforms um, is uh, is growing and is a legitimate business opportunity for us to participate in. The uh, exploration, uh, working with government, getting out to the moon, um, and the uh, entire uh, activities that are coming soon in cisgender space uh, to be able to have uh, a new space station at the moon, uh, habitats on the moon, vehicle mobility systems on the lunar surface, network uh, communication networks on the lunar surface, the ability to grow food and conduct mining, um, as Janet mentioned, um, on the moon, um, allows us to solve all that technology basis to do that in other planetary area, other planets uh, moving forward into the future. So um, our ability to um, access resources in other planets is driven, will be driven by um, all this exploration activity. Um, and then all of the skills that we get from that, uh, we can bring into that um, on orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing area that Jana was talking about. Um, and then uh, a lot of that is transferable, you know, back to Earth, um, as Brian was talking about earlier with his examples around telemedicine and the like. That, um, you know, once we uh, figure out how to have long-term missions on the moon and diagnose and take care of ourselves and, uh, you know, perform basic surgeries and things like that, you know, all of that will be transferable from, uh, to, you know, the distance-based telemedicine as an example that Brian was using, um, you know, here on Earth. So um, there's, a, there's, a good, there's a good circle there. There's a good life cycle of technology and innovation um, that uh, you know will uh, be of benefit and is a legitimate economic growth area for the for the, the upcoming decades. Brian, 
I, I agree with Janet and Mike, so I'll just add uh, maybe more kind of philosophical stuff. From my point of view, I think there's nothing that puts into perspective how we're all just a bunch of humans. We're all just people trying to make it, make our make our lives work. We're just trying to be happy when when we are exploring outside uh, our, our planet. I mean, it has the the potential to bring us together like never before. Uh, it has done so in the past and hopefully it will do so in the future. And then to add on to what Mike had mentioned a little earlier, imagine in the 1400s that somebody be like, hey, there's some like, there's quite a bit of water going that way. Like, should we go explore? No, no, let's, let's stay here. I don't want to invest in that. Like, let's, let's just stay where we're at. So, so now we know the answer as to why if somebody was on some panel in the 1400s being asked, like, why should we be going and looking and exploring the water? Um, we, we know the answers now. So in, you know, X amount of centuries, they're going to say, well, thank goodness they did, uh, because we now know X, we now know Y, we've now been able to do all these different things. So, so to me, that's pretty inspirational. It's pretty cool that our generation can take some leaps and bounds in making that a possibility. Well, thank you. Uh, I I'd, like, more. I'd like to thank the panelists. It's been fascinating. Thank you, everyone. And um, let's give them a round of applause.